This video workshop is going to work you through how we might go about writing about literature, writing about the things that we read. To start, I want to get us to examine what are some of our current habits of reading. So we're going to start with a writing into the day or into this video, and I want you to pause the video, take out your daybook, and take some time to write down about this topic or, as always, anything you're thinking of right now. We'll come back and talk about this regardless of what you choose to write about for this writing into the day moment. But if you're gonna choose this topic, I'd like you to think about and write down everything you think you do when you're given something to read in class. Think about your steps, behaviors, and just general things you do from when you get the reading to when you finish. Pause the video now and do this writing in your daybook. I'll be writing along with you. Welcome back. Let's talk a little bit about this writing into the day. So I want us to think about and share what is working? What are the things that you're doing that you feel are working for you as a reader? What are the things that you think you might need to do differently? Is there anything about your current habits as you're thinking about what you do when you sit down to read something, particularly for class, that you're thinking maybe I don't do as well or it's not as effective as it could be. What are those things? Let's talk about those. Some things that I know that I do or are that I sit in a very comfortable, almost lying down manner when I'm sitting down to read. So think about how that might be affecting my approach to the reading. I might be very relaxed, which is great, but I also might start to fall asleep, which doesn't exactly lend itself to me being a really engaged reader, you know? So let's talk about what things we might need to do differently or want to learn. Let's also think about what if we have to write about what we read? Is there anything we would need to be doing differently while we're reading in order to make that next step more helpful or prepare us a little better? So given everything that we've discussed, we've kind of got our minds going on, let's think about what we do while we read, particularly if we know we're going to have to write about what we read. So we're going to try on some things today, modeling and practicing together with a short piece of literature, a short story called Eleven. So I'm going to hand out the story Eleven and we're going to work through it together. What we're going to do is I'm going to read this opening paragraph aloud to you and I want you to do whatever you think you should do as I'm reading and then we're going to talk about uh, your initial reactions. This is called Eleven by Sandra Cisneros. What they don't understand about birthdays and what they never tell you is that when you're 11, you're also 10 and 9 and 8 and 7 and 6 and 5 and 4 and 3 and 2 and 1. And when you wake up on your 11th birthday, you expect to feel 11, but you don't. You open your eyes and everything's just like yesterday, only it's today. And you are underneath the year that makes you 11. So what are you noticing yourself doing just as I was reading that opening paragraph? Tell me some things you saw yourself doing. Okay, so we're sharing what we think we see ourselves or notice ourselves doing as we're reading and now I'm going to offer you something to try on and do while we're reading to just feel what it's like to engage in a certain way while you are reading a piece of literature. So I'm going to give you a handout and it's going to uh, look like and get you started on the double entry journal. So what you need to do to prepare for the double entry journal is you need to take out a blank page in your daybook probably where you've got two blank pages in front of you, so it might be the back of one and the front of the next. 
and we're going to create two columns on each of those pages. So in order to create the columns, you can either fold the page in half, and that will create a line on that fold, or you can just draw a line down the middle of your page. In the left-hand column, I want you to label that note-taking, and in the right-hand column, I want you to label that response to notes. So what do you think we're going to do in the note-taking column? You're brilliant. Yes, we're going to take some notes. Now, these are things directly from the reading. So this is where we might identify a quote or a word, something that comes up directly from the text that we want to remember for whatever reason later, something that we could summarize from the reading, a detail, a moment that happens in a scene, just anything that strikes our fancy, not really worried about why we're noticing it, but that's what's going to go in that note-taking side. So as we're reading, and even sometimes after we're reading, we're going to use this left-hand column to capture moments that, for whatever reason, stood out to us as we were reading. Now, as you're taking those notes, you just need to be able to point back to them or get back to them in the text. So sometimes just a quick word and maybe a page or a paragraph number or the start of a quote with ellipses, the dot, dot, dots, so that you know you can remember where it was and get back to it quickly, but you don't have to capture you know, two, three lines of quotes. That'll bog you down a little bit too much. So that's what's happening in the note-taking side. And the response to no side, that's all about you. So column two, the column on the right, is where you're going to be responding to that note you just took. And we'll talk about where in your reading and in your process for note taking you might do this. But these responses could be questions that came up, like I didn't know what that word meant, or um, something about the character that you were curious about and you wrote that note down and so you want to respond to it. Maybe something you noticed about what the writer was doing in the text. Um, so you could make a comment on, I see the writer is doing X um, in this particular passage or scene or whatever the case may be. But this is your response, your thoughts to whatever that information from the text was. So what we're going to do is we're going to reread the opening paragraph, and I'm going to model up here on the doc cam in my daybook the double entry note taking. Now, because I'm reading out loud, I'm going to do my note taking after I get done reading. You can feel free to do it while I'm reading, rereading this opening paragraph, or you can also wait till we get finished. What they don't understand about birthdays and what they never tell you is that when you're 11, you're also 10 and 9 and 8 and 7 and 6 and 5 and 4 and 3 and 2 and 1. And when you wake up on your 11th birthday, you expect to feel 11, but you don't. You open your eyes and everything's just like yesterday, only it's today. And you are underneath the year that makes you 11. Okay, so I want you to go back if you haven't already, and write down any element of that opening paragraph. It might be a word, it might be a quote, it might be a couple of words, it might be a detail, and put that at least one note entry in your left-hand column. And then after you're done with that, I want you to respond to that note. Why did you write it down? What were you thinking? Do you have a question about it? Just any response that's coming to mind, and I'm going to do this as you do it as well. So let's talk about who would like to share one of the notes that they wrote down just from this opening paragraph. So a quick moment in teacher talk. As I move forward with this piece, I tend to read the entire piece out loud. It's short, and I do think that we kind of lose sight of reading out loud to older students, and so I find my students really revel in the fact that they get read to with something like this. Um, I also offer the students, as I mentioned before, the option to record the double entry journals as I'm reading, after we get done reading, or kind of a mix of the two. They might take a note here and there and then go back 
and work through the text one more time. This is a nice opportunity also to have them reread it on their own after I've read it out loud, and that's when the note taking can happen. So you can play around with what feels right given your age of your student, the level of your student, the comfort, um, if this is a totally foreign concept, if this is something new, we can kind of pick up the pace. I'm assuming this is kind of a, a beginning of the year, beginning of the class, beginning of the semester type of moment. So I'm it, potentially introducing this, although you are familiar with it because we did something like this with one of our own readings at the beginning of the semester. So I just wanted to point to that a little bit before moving forward. Now that we've worked through our entire text and reading this piece and you've completed your double entry journals and you've responded to those double entry journal entries, I want to give you some time to just kind of do a what are you thinking now? What, is, what are any immediate responses that you're having to the reading outside of this note taking moment? So you can draw a line under your notes or you can turn to a new page and I want you to take 2.67 minutes in your daybook and just jot down anything that you feel you're responding to feeling in response to this reading right now. Okay, start to wrap up your thoughts. And now I want you to turn to someone near you or one or two people near you, and I just want you to share. You can talk directly from your daybook, read from your daybook, but anything that you're thinking about this text, just want to give you some time to talk to each other and see what things you're noticing or reacting to similarly and what things are different. And as you're talking to each other, if your brilliant partners or your small group make you think of something new, where do you want to write it down? Absolutely. Jot that down in your daybook. Feel free to add that information. So talk with each other now. I heard some good things as I was walking around and listening to the groups talk to each other. Um, now I want to shift over into teacher talk for a moment. So after I would do a pair share, I might open this up for class discussion and as students are talking, this could be a moment for us collectively or just me, write down things that they're saying on the board, things that um, they're noticing, and then I might begin to help. This is where me, maybe the literary terms start to come in. So as they're starting to name stuff about the particular characters in this text, um, then I might say, what do we call the people? that are in text with the authors when they present somebody? Who, who are those people? Oh yeah, characters, yep, okay, we call those characters, good. Okay, now what about characters? What do authors, what do writers do with their characters? Do they stay the same, do they change? Okay, sometimes they stay the same, sometimes they change, right, right? And then I can move into naming this. What do we call the ones that don't change? Okay, that's static. What do we call the ones that do change? Dynamic. So you see, you could build in, this could be an easy moment to build in some of the naming, but we haven't front-loaded that. So we didn't start with, today we're going to learn about static characters or dynamic characters. You're starting with the students and their response to the reading. And guess what? They've already probably filled up a page or two in their daybook. So we've already got the writing going on. And so now we're going to move into how we might start actually shifting to writing more specifically about this literature using um, the writing about literature handout. So what I'm going to ask you to do now is to take the handout I just gave you and I want you to look at numbers 1 through 9. And this is going to give you opportunity to start to think about what you just read in a different way. So you've taken some notes from the text, you've engaged as a reader, that may be something you're used to doing or something a little different. You've responded to those notes, you've talked with others about them, you've done some additional writing and responding in your daybook, and now we want to move that a little bit more forward and give you a little bit of a more focused way to respond. So I'd like you to just look at numbers one through nine and just choose one or two to allow yourself to engage with the reading further. So whichever you choose, you're gonna do this in your daybook so it's informal, low stakes, you don't need to worry about writing perfectly right now. And just see which one of the options are speaking to you and just go with it and play with it. You can draw from your daybook writing, you can draw from your um, double entry journals, you can draw from things you heard your partner saying, anything that's gonna help you kind of work through one through nine. As you start one of the um, topics or ideas, if it doesn't bear fruit, you're not liking it, just 
draw a line, switch, and do another one, okay? We're gonna let this uh, finish us out in class. I'm gonna walk around and touch base with you, answer any questions, maybe read through a little bit of what you're writing as you're willing to share. And we're gonna let this um, finish us up in class today. Anything you don't finish today, you can move into homework for this evening and we'll pick back up with it tomorrow. So another little bit of teacher talk. This last step might be where class has to end today, depending on how much time and the speed at which students are able to work through the short story and complete the double entry journal um, writing and free, free writing in their daybook and talking with each other. If you have a long class discussion after the pair share moment, then that might end class. Um, I would advise not just strictly sending students out for homework unless you feel like you've got a group of students that are mature enough and able to handle any questions that might come up without it turning into they come in the next day with nothing because they felt like they didn't know what to do. So with the focus reader response, the writing about literature handout, you want to make sure um, that students feel comfortable doing that if you are going to send them away doing it for homework. But it certainly could be a nice um, formative assessment that you use and have students bring in for the next day. So now I'm going to move into teacher talk before I shift back into student mode and ask you to begin working on the body biography. One way that I move into analysis is through visuals. And you saw some of the options in the focus reader response handout, writing about literature handout, that there were some visuals, some drawing opportunities there. But I particularly wanted to comment that these activities with the body biography handout, if done thoroughly, can easily take a day. So I'm going to get you started on this as a, quote, student, but you can see how this could um, be adapted or molded into much grander things um, if you were doing these, depending on the level and the age and the maturity of the class. This is also, I know many teachers who go and get the large, big contact paper actually trace out a student's body. Um, so this is a fun time to play with the art teacher and maybe even have a day in the art room depending on how your school and your, your environment is set up. Um, what really makes the body biography piece is the requirement for textual evidence. And so I'll point to that as I'm talking in back in um, teacher and student mode. Okay, now that we are working back and have looked at in detail our reading, we've done some different types of writing about our reading, mostly in form on low stakes. We're going to start to shift this into how can we start to make sense of our reading and analyze our reading. And we're going to do this in a little bit of a non-traditional way. We're going to recreate what's called a body biography. So what is the purpose? Why would we do this? What the heck is a body biography? Well, this is going to be a creative way to discuss and show understanding of a particular character in the literature. Remember yesterday we talked about characterization. Who can remind me what were some of the elements of characterization? What do writers do? So in groups, we're going to choose a character and we're going to create a body biography, a visual and written portrait illustrating several aspects of the character's life within the story. So with 11, we get a very short moment here with our characters, but we're still able to make sense of them in very particular ways because of the choices the author made. Here are some of the things you want to make sure that you have and include in your body biography. So you want to make sure there are important events captured. Who can remind me of one important event from the story 11 by Sandra Cisneros? So we're also going to want to create visual symbols. We're also most importantly going to create, going to include original text from the story. Specifically, you need three to five sentences or quotes from the story. Where do you think you're going to find those three to five quotes. Absolutely, you've got them in your daybook ready to rock and roll. Now, your group might decide that each one of you can contribute a quote or you might find some new ones, go back into the text. So what else are you going to need while you're working on the biography? Yes, you're going to need the text. So you're going to want to make sure you have the short story by you. Okay, a little teacher talk. So absolutely, I go into all the details about the body biography assignment, and then I let students start to work on this. This is an example from the story 11. This is a choice uh, that the student made to create uh, a body biography of the sweater because the students felt like, this, this particular student, this was working individually, felt like 
the sweater was its own character, which makes a lot of sense. So you see the visual, we see some symbols like 11. On the spine, we've got the big buttons. On the spine is an important quote that represented for the student um, maybe the backbone of this sweater, this character um, that the student felt needed to be represented. So while you may not have examples yet, you can certainly use this one. You can also um, probably Google and find body, bi body biographies. Um, this is not kind of a new thing, so to speak. But that textual piece, that evidence from the text is really important. Students really like drawing pictures a lot of times and can really spend a lot of time doing that and thinking about visual ways to represent key moments in the story. Um, but that textual analysis support, how do they know that this is what would represent visually? They need to be able to make that very clear. So that's just a little teacher talk um, to kind of make sure as you're moving students through this that it doesn't just become a fun picture day. Your body biographies are awesome. I've really enjoyed showing them in the hall to everyone. And the teachers, the principal, other students have come up and said, what is this? What are you guys doing? I want to be in your class. And they're sh really praising you guys. So you guys have got some really cool stuff going. So this was really an interesting way to capture your thinking about the reading as groups and in a visual as well as textual way. So we're going to go back to that focused reader response handout, remember, that we worked on and you were using um, to do some work for the uh, just getting your mind thinking about the story and responding to it and writing in a different way than just your notes in your daybook. So now we're going to move beyond numbers one through nine, and we're going to find all the options that have formal analysis at the end of them. So I want you to just take a pen or, or marker and just star or highlight the ones that say formal analysis, okay? And what we're going to work on right now is picking one of those. And just like we did for numbers one through nine, as you start one of these, maybe it doesn't feel good for you or you're not really sure or feeling comfortable, you can shift and choose another one. So feel free to start a draft, a, a very rough draft, a word vomit on any of these. So we're going to pick one of those. And what are we going to use to help, for instance, help us work through um, what makes a character likable, believable, or strong-willed in this story? What details are used to describe the character? What makes you admire, probably in this case, her, if you're choosing maybe one of the key characters or the key character? Well, absolutely, you're going to look back at your double entry journals. You're more than welcome to, as you're writing, kind of lean over and talk with someone, or you can remember some of the conversations you've had over the past few days. You can use your work from when you were working on numbers one through nine. Some of that writing might find its way into this one. And then you can also certainly use the information from the body biography. You could choose that character for this particular example to base um, your draft, your beginning off of. So we're gonna take about 15 to 20 minutes. Again, I'll be walking around and we're just spending this time, this is a writing time. So it will feel quiet, but you can feel free to talk with each other, talk with me, stop and start, um, shift around and use your tools, go outside, look at the body biography if you need to get some ideas, but always, always come back to that text, right? Um, and make sure that we're drawing from the text as we make some of these claims about um, the reading and our responses to it. Now I'm going to shift strictly into teacher talk. So what I've kind of walked you through as a student with your teacher hat on as well is thinking about how we can scaffold and take students through the process of reading something, writing to understand the reading, taking that writing and those ideas to respond, get our initial personal response from it as a reader, and then starting to shape that personal response into textual analysis. Um, so hopefully you've seen some of that emerge and are already thinking of ways that you can adapt these ideas in your own classroom for your own writing um, and whatnot. What I want to also hope that you see is that this is not necessarily lending itself to a formal literary analysis where a student picks a particular literary element to focus on and writes a traditional 
um, paragraphed uh, with secondary sources type of writing. Doesn't mean that you can't go there. And I think doing something, some of these activities beforehand really helps the students get prepared for that more traditional piece. What I want to offer you now is an additional non-traditional piece that's becoming quite more traditional, which is a multi-genre um, assignment. And that is the last handout that we have to look at. So with the multi-genre is a response to literature through a variety of narratives and genres rather than through expository abstract language. Um, this gives a brief introduction into multi-genre if you're not familiar with it. We've talked about it through our multi-genre, multimodal type of writing. You're kind of practicing it um, in your inquiry project multimodal write-up. But this is also something we can open up to students, and I hope you're um, willing to explore this with me. So similar to what we've already been doing in this particular series of lessons or lesson plan that I've walked you through is the idea of picking a character from the reading assignment and um, jotting down notes about them, thinking about their life, philosophy, so on. Students probably already have this if you've worked them through what we just worked through um, as quote students. And then the idea of uh, trying to show us the character through these genres, and in this case this is just a getting started so they could just choose one genre to work on, um, is a really fun way to kind of flip and get students out of um, shifting into this writing identity that maybe doesn't match them very well, which is a traditional essay form with paragraphs and things like that. They tend to sound not like themselves. And so this uh, idea of multi-genre and picking a different way to represent a character and ideas from a literature, also with the option of pulling in secondary sources, is really interesting and, and can um, allow students to meet standards and learning outcomes and grow as writers in ways that I find a traditional analysis maybe doesn't work or a combination of the two. So looking at some examples, we've got some um, examples that I've pulled. This one's on Native Sun. And this example actually comes from my teacher talk. Um, this is a slide from another teacher kind of talking about multi-genre projects. And this example came from that. So a representation to the reader, to talk to the reader about what's going on in this piece. And then you're going to see like a wanted ad, historical snapshot, um, script writing, um, just visuals. I'll let you work through it. It's really fascinating when you start to see these art newspaper articles. Okay. Then this page is really nice because it's a teacher site and she's got different classes, composition class, literature class, AP English class, and they're different multi-genre projects that they created. And they're just beautiful um, just to look at them visually. And I just want you to picture you've got to read a stack of traditional essays or you get to read a stack of these. Now you are noticing that these are digital so we could talk through and work through. You can see how this is something that's been converted into a PDF, but it started obviously as a Microsoft Word document. Um, so there still are some traditional elements to it, but even just allowing students to bring in visuals within their traditional paragraph writing, um, not only is a very real world type of thing, we don't read too many things these days online or even in print that don't have some kind of visual accompanying it. But it's just something, uh, a different way for students to represent their response, their understanding, and their analysis to the reader. Look at how they captured that letter from Charlotte Bronte. Pretty cool. So these are some things that I just want you to reflect on and think about. And I definitely want to hear um, your thoughts on these as you're working through the musings. Um, if you're able to get to through this before the end of the literature and composition um, musing and response. And then also into next week, um, the second week, full week in April, maybe as we're working on our philosophies and things like that, or if anyone wants to start a new musing. So I know this was a long module, but I look forward to hearing from you all about it.